DMEC is not physically difficult to do. It's not some athletic feat that you have to be a superman to perform. The problem with DMEC, especially in complicated eyes, is the complexity of the decision making. It's knowing what to do when. It's knowing how to handle difficult circumstances. And I think that's what this video is about. It's about how to make some of these tough decisions in sick eyes to make DMEC possible. So this is an eye that I operated on in our office four days ago. This is a patient that has a failed opacified PK and an ACIOL, which is barely visible in the anterior chamber, cocooned up in all of this fibrotic anterior synechia. We're doing this case with oral Valium and topical lidocaine supplemented with Expirel, which is liposomal bupivacaine. It's a subtenons block that lasts three days. And we like doing these complicated cases preferentially in our office as opposed to a hospital because we have better control over the environment in our office. So that's the first thing is that we like to do these cases where I've got the greatest control over the circumstances. Now you might be saying, well, why do a DMEC at all in this case? Why not do a PK? But I firmly believe the first important decision is if you have a cornea that is edematous, you should try DMEC first before you do a PK because you can get shocking clearance of the cornea and that may improve the patient's vision to a satisfactory degree. You can always go back and do a PK later but once you've done a PK, you can't go back. So I like to try the DMEC first. And certainly, I think there is basically no indication anymore these days for a DSEC. Any situation in which you can do a DSEC, you can do a DMEC also. So here's how we start the case. The patient's being administered a subtenons block to get us going. Once the block has been administered, I'll make my paracentesis and use an anterior chamber maintainer. My assistant is holding a 60 cc syringe with air and he's pumping that air into the eye. And because of all this anterior synechia and this fibrosis, you'll notice the air is misdirecting back behind the ACIOL. The anterior chamber is not being formed but that's okay. What I will do is just painstakingly work my way around with this inverted Sinsky hook to try to establish plane between the front of the ACIOL and the back of the cornea. And this is being done under direct visualization with air. You have to use air. That's the next important decision-making step is you can't strip these eyes under viscoelastic because you can't see. You have to use air so you can see what the heck it is that you're doing because your visibility is paramount. You'll also notice that I'm not removing the epithelium because if you debride the epithelium of the cornea, transiently your view is increased, but then it gets worse again. So I'm going to wait to play that card if I need it until right before I'm doing something where I have to see maximally, like unfolding the graft. You don't want to burn that opportunity now when you're feeling around inside of the eye. Okay, now as I continue to pick at the back of the cornea, I'm staying away from the PK interface because I don't want to de-hiss the graft there by being overly aggressive. And you have to be aggressive when you're trying to peel this leathery fibrotic decimase membrane from the back of a PK. So I'm approaching the interface with this inverted Sinsky hook, but I'm not engaging it directly. And the other thing you'll notice is as I continue with this, I'm switching periodically from an inverted Sinsky hook to a coaxial serrated forcep. And I'm using that to sort of feel around the back of the cornea to test sort of the tensile integrity of the tissue that I'm pulling to try to figure out what it is. Is this scar? Is this endothelium? What is going on here with the back of the cornea? And sometimes I can't tell just by looking but this situation is just seeming bizarre to me. There are multiple bubbles inside of the eye. They're, they're not overlapping. They're sort of seemingly at different planes. That's what I'm observing here. So I'm trying to figure out anatomically what is going on with this eye. And at one point here during the case, about 30 minutes into the operation, and this whole time has been spent so far just trying to strip the back of the cornea, what I discover right about here 
and I'm sorry, it's off the screen as soon as I mention that, is I find that there's a retrocorneal membrane on the back of the cornea. And I discover that when I'm peeling around with these serrated coaxial forceps. And after I discover that retrocorneal membrane and I start peeling it and pulling it with these forceps, what is revealed is that the cornea atop that retrocorneal membrane is shockingly clear. It's amazing how clear the actual PK itself is. And I'm delicately going around with these forceps. And not only am I using these serrated forceps, but I'm also using coaxial micro scissors to cut this retrocorneal membrane free from its attachments in the periphery and to peel this big wad of scarified tissue out of the eye. And once all of that is done, here is what the eye looks like. This is what the eye looks like after it's been liberated of that retrocorneal membrane. It is just shockingly clear. And you look down and you can see the anterior chamber, IOL, you can see the iris, you can see the anatomy so much better, and you think, okay, I can work with this. I can fix this eye, okay? So that is an important concept also, is to interrogate the anatomy of the eye and to strip off any scarified tissue, including by cutting it free using coaxial scissors. Now it looks like we are about ready to inject the DMAC graft. So here it is. Now, the next important decision-making step here is to use a graft diameter that is smaller than the diameter of the recipient PK. This PK is 7.75 millimeters, so I'm using a 7 millimeter DMAC graft, and I'm using a donor 70 years old or older because those tissues are uh, tend to unscroll easier. And when you have a complicated eye and you worry about unscrolling the graft in such circumstances, I like to use a loose roll that wants to unfold. I'm injecting it into the eye using this Dork D-O-R-C glass cannula. And the graft, I'm sort of puffing at it with the syringe and it doesn't really want to go. So the way that I get it to inject is I rotate the plunger. And when I rotate the plunger, that loosens it and lets me inject it into the eye. So there the graft is in the eye on top of the ACIOL. There's this little air bubble. The first step is just to aspirate that bubble, always using a cannula with a syringe on BSS, not air, because I don't want to aspirate air with air. It'll get foam. Here I am checking the orientation with the Motsuro sign. After I check the orientation, I just poke the graft over and open using that same cannula. That's called the help yourself technique invented by my dad. And it's just a quick and dirty, mechanical, physical way to open the graft up in a challenging circumstance. There the graft is. It's nearly completely unfolded already, sitting on top of the ACI well. Its orientation is proper. And of course, now, of, you know, the height of the tension, the patient starts looking around under the operating microscope. So you have to calm everybody down and get ready to finish the case. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put an air bubble underneath the graft to try to lift it up to the posterior corneal surface. And as I'm trying to inject, the air is not coming out. So I remove the cannula, I sort of go in and out a couple of times, then I put it back in the eye underneath the graft and I'm pushing down again with the plunger. And you'll notice I get a big air bubble that sort of jumps out of the syringe underneath the graft. That's okay. I've got an inward fold here. In order to resolve that fold, I have to shrink the size of the bubble. So I'm aspirating some of that bubble with my BSS cannula, then I'm injecting BSS into the eye on a paracentesis, and then I'm applying some taps on the corneal surface. Now normally, this sort of tap on the surface of the eye, that's called the Dirazomer technique to unfold these lingering edges. When you have a bubble underneath the graft and you're tapping on the surface, that's called the Dirazomer bubble. So here I am doing a few Dirazomer bubble traps to the taps to try to unfold the graft, but I'm having a problem. That is, the graft is sort of still interacting there with the edge of the patient's PK. So, what do I do about it? Well, what I'm going to try to do here, which doesn't work, is I'm going to try to grab the edge of the graft with these coaxial forceps and drag it over. And the reason it's not working is because the chamber is shallow and because there's that air bubble underneath the graft which is right in the vicinity of the part of the graft that I want to grab. So I can't really see what I'm doing, and that bubble is blocking me from grabbing the graft. 
So I'm trying to deepen the chamber, get that bubble to shrink a little bit, maybe move out of the way. That's what these jets of fluid are, but it's not working. The bubble's still obnoxious and sitting there, so I just remove it, okay? So now the bubble is removed, and I'm gonna go back in with the same coaxial forceps through the main wound. I'm gonna grab the graft and drag it over. That's what I'm doing there. And this method of centering the graft is so much better than taps on the corneal surface. I love a no-touch technique as much as anybody else for DMEC unfolding, but this is so much more predictable and safer for centering a DMEC graft and an eye with a PK than any other technique that I know of. And that's always the most challenging part for me, DMEC and eyes with PKs, is centering the graft. The other thing that's important is you should never suture the main wound when you're doing a DMEC. I don't know why everybody is suturing the main wound. The graft is not going to reflux eject out of the main wound as long as you're not overpressurizing the eye. And you need the main wound. You need to use it for your manipulations. It's so much more facile. It's so much more convenient than any of these little small measly paracentesis. So if you're suturing the main wound, you're closing off your access to the best part of the eye where you can do the most good in terms of moving the graft over, like dragging it with these coaxial forceps. And this is it. Here's the graft up against the back of the cornea. This is the end of the case. I'm hydrating the wound, and I almost never do that if I'm doing DMAC in an eye for Fuchs dystrophy, because I worry about the fluid in the cornea billowing the, back, the graft off the back of the cornea or swelling the cornea and that precipitating a detachment. But when you have that interface with the PK, I think you can inject peripheral to that interface and it doesn't really cause the PK central to that interface to swell. So in my experience, that has been a good thing that has worked out for us. So what are the sort of tips for doing DMEC in this situation? Well, the first thing is you have to believe in the possibility of this surgery. You know, I think most people would look at this eye, this basically opaque previous PK in a sick eye with an ACIOL and think, okay, well, let's replace this PK with another PK or let's do a DSEC in such an eye. But you have to believe that it's possible to do these cases. And if you're not pushing yourself a little bit, then you'll never take the next step, okay? So that's an important consideration is to believe that these surgeries can be done. But also the decision-making should be to do the surgery in the best possible environment, whatever that is for you. For us, it's to do it in the office. The third thing is to do the decimetorexis, which for me is the hardest part of the surgery under air. You know, that is an operation that took one hour and 58 minutes of that hour were the decimetorexis. So that's the hard part of the surgery. And in order to make that possible, you have to do it under air so you can see what you're doing and you have to have serrated coaxial micro grasping forceps so you can pick and pull at that retrocorneal membrane. I should have gotten a preoperative corneal OCT to identify that retrocorneal membrane before the case, but I didn't, so I had to discover that unpleasantly during the operation. Once the graft was injected, you know, of course, it's important to use a smaller diameter graft than the PK and to use an older donor so it wants to unfold on its own. I like to use a help yourself technique to manually open the graft rather than transmitting these taps on the surface of the cornea, which are unpredictably executed in eyes that have had a PK in the past. And I like to grab the graft and drag it over with these coaxial forceps. So this was a time intensive DMET case. This was an operation that took me an hour. But the actual challenging thing, the graft unfolding, the intellectual difficulty, that was not difficult. And the reason it's not difficult is because you have strategies that you can employ that are your reliable go-tos for solving these cases. So if you are worried about doing DMEC in situations like this, you shouldn't be because there are so many great strategies that you can employ. If you have a complicated case and you're worried about it, call me or email me or text me or so. I would love to help you in any way I can to do more and more challenging cases and to have more fun.